Hello neighbors and friends, my name is Carrie Rodriguez, a fourth generation resident of the city of Somerville, and I am excited to welcome you to the debate of the candidates for election to the Somerville City Council in Ward 7, brought to you by the Somerville Media Center. I am joined in the studio by Becca Miller, Alex Anderson, and Judy Pineda Neufeld. Maria Kutzabaras was invited to participate in today's debate, but did not accept our invitation. In the next hour, I will be asking each of the candidates a series of questions regarding the issues facing Ward 7 after compiling them following a series of conversations with residents in the neighborhood. Following my questions, each candidate will have the opportunity to pose a 30-second question to their fellow candidates, after which they will have one minute to respond. During the course of the debate, I will allow those whose names are invoked to respond for 30 seconds or may ask a candidate to further explain a question. I have been empowered to keep the debate civil and can stop taping if personal attacks or low blows are made. And I will say, as the mother of five and a lifelong resident of the city, I am uniquely qualified <laughs> and more than up to that challenge. We will begin the debate by offering each candidate an opportunity to introduce themselves to you with a brief two-minute statement. We're going to begin with Becca Miller. Awesome. Well, hi everyone, my name is Becca Miller and I'm running to be the next Ward 7 City Councilor. For the last five years, I've called Somerville home and started to build a community here. And like the majority of Ward 7 residents, I'm a renter. I'm running for City Council because I want to change the status quo and build a community that works for all of us. Somerville has a progressive reputation, but we're in need of deep transformative change if we want to build a community that truly reflects our values and ends our displacement and affordability crises. I work as an organizer to build food security with low-income families and farmers across the state and my job where I manage a campaign to get the state to increase funding for this program that helps folks with SNAP or food stamps buy veggies from local farmers. We've won $47 million from the state since 2017 and really built up organizers across the state through this work. Through my work, I've built consensus among the coalition and with state legislators around our shared values to pass policy year after year. I strongly believe that we need to build up our community so that Somerville is a truly welcoming, inclusive, and cohesive community. I'm running on a strong platform that includes housing justice, a Somerville Green New Deal, and racial and economic justice. Thank you, and I look forward to the moderator's questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Next, Alex. Right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, my name is Alex Anderson, and I am seeking your vote for Somerville City Council Ward 7 seat. I am running for city council because I believe that local government is about ensuring everyone has access to and positive experiences with the right services to meet their needs so that they can thrive in our community. Like the majority of our neighborhood, I am a liberal progressive committed to racial equity, social justice, affordability, and sustainability. And I believe that I have the right experiences and capability to translate these progressive ideas into practical solutions for our neighborhood. As a first time candidate for office, I like to share a bit about me. I'm a husband and a dad, a systems thinker and healthcare researcher, a racial equity and street safety advocate, and your neighbor. My wife Allison and I moved to Simpson Avenue in Ward 7 eight years ago and have loved living and renting in Ward 7 ever since. Almost three years ago, Riley joined our family and last September our youngest son Cameron joined the fun in the middle of the pandemic. Allison and I moved to Ward 7 for access to public transit and a thriving local business and recreational community. We are choosing to raise our family here because we can walk to parks, playgrounds, and schools while enjoying all the arts, culture, and entertainment and community engagement that our neighborhood has to offer. As the only parent in this race, I know what it means to be in a household of working parents, renting our home, and doing all that we can to make our neighborhood work better for us. My, acad my academic background is in economics. I studied business and public policy to understand how we can make right decisions based on understanding data and the experience that it has on humans in the community to get the best decisions together. For the last 10 years, I've worked at a local not-for-profit called the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, where I've studied complex healthcare systems to understand what's working in healthcare and how we can apply those ideas. I intend to bring this systems thinking and my advocacy throughout my work to the work that we do on City Council to make the neighborhood work best for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Judy? Thank you. My name is Judy Pineda Neufeld, and I'm running for Somerville City Council in Ward 7. I'm a Mexican-American and Jewish woman and the proud daughter of two immigrant parents who raised me to honor and celebrate my roots. Like mi abuelita, who was born and raised in Mexico City and raised her nine kids with love, strength, and compassion. And my nanny, who spent her teenage years in hiding during the Holocaust 
keeping her siblings safe while the world outside was at war. Passion and persistence, I think it's just a part of my DNA. I'm running for city council because this moment demands bold leadership. And the neighborhoods of Ward 7 deserve a city councilor with both the lived and professional experience to take action on our common challenges from day one. For the last 17 months, I've been leading the Immigrant Services Unit under Somerville's COVID operations, working to bring bringing critical resources to our city's immigrant neighbors, like access to food, rental assistance, and most recently vaccines. Once vaccines became available but hard to find, I set up a partnership with the Massachusetts Immigrant Collaborative, which allowed us to book more than 300 vaccine appointments for at the Reggie Lewis Center for our immigrant neighbors and get them access to much needed transportation for those appointments. As your Ward 7 City Councilor, I'll continue to amplify the voices of those most impacted. I'll fight for a COVID-19 recovery plan that brings additional relief to small businesses and those still out of work. I'll fight for more affordable and accessible housing by passing a fair housing amendment and will support the needs of the tenants of Clarendon Hill during its redevelopment. I'll pursue policies for safer walking, biking, and transit access for all, and will pilot a fair free bus program. Fighting for equitable access, it's not just a buzzword for me. It's the way I live and it's the way I lead. I'm a small business owner, community organizer, renter, and public servant to the city of Somerville and I'm looking forward to bringing this perspective to the City Council. Thank you. Thank you. I will now begin with a series of questions for the candidates. The subject, uh, but not the specific question, has already been shared with the candidates. I will begin with the issue of transportation, city streets, and safety. Candidates will each have one minute to answer the question. Ward 7, and in particular Broadway and Powder House, are considered to be the gateway to Boston from many greater Boston suburbs. With Teal Square receiving a failing grade from MassDOT and more than 8 in 10 cars passing through Somerville not stopping at a Somerville residence or business, how will you work to increase safety for local residents in Ward 7? And in particular, I would like you to address the areas of Alwife Brook Parkway and the intersection of Holland and Cameron Street specifically. Uh, we'll start with Alex. Great. Thank you so much. I'm very excited that we are starting with this question because this is the key issue in terms of what I think a Ward 7 Councilor needs to champion. Our neighborhood is a cut-through neighborhood for a lot of regional areas and we prioritize cut-through traffic more than we prioritize the people who live here. In terms of Holland and Cameron Street, I believe we need a raised pedestrian intersection. The table speed bump is what it's called, so the entire intersection where pedestrians would cross would be at sidewalk level, which makes it more accessible for people with walking needs, more accessible for people who have children, um, and it also serves as a traffic calming measure um, for traffic that is driving down the street. I also want to see the city move forward with the priority bus lane down Holland from the bus station in front of the um, Clarendon Hill Towers all the way into the uh, Davis Square by the red line to prioritize bus traffic to make sure that people are getting into work without getting bogged down in congestion. That also makes it better for bikers. I'm the only candidate here who has experience working directly with the city on transportation improvement. It's what I did of my five years as a mayoral appointed volunteer for the Somerville Bicycle Committee, and I've worked directly with the city on these projects. For me, this is the core reason that we run, is to make sure our streets work for everybody. Thank you, Alex. Judy? Um, thanks so much. Like Alex, I agree with the intersection at Holland and Cameron Ave needing, needing some traffic calming measures in particular. I see a lot of families with strollers, those with wheelchairs trying to cross over that intersection, and vehicles just trying to fly by. So it's definitely a public safety and public health issue. Um, in terms of the Alewife Brook um, intersection that's being redesigned as a re result of the Clarendon Hill redevelopment, thank God we got state money um, for that. Um, that is looking to be a more of a T intersection instead of a rotary, um, which should also increase safety around there. Um, I also have heard from residents who live at Clarendon Hill Towers that the intersection where they cross the street to stop and shop is also unsafe. So looking at ways to increase safety there and looking at more increased bike lanes and bus lanes across the city. I'm excited about the bike and bus lane going down Holland Ave, um, or at least the proposal that's in place. Um, and I believe we should look to Cambridge for some inspiration, like passing a cycling safety ordinance that requires city streets to be upgraded to include the safest bike paths wherever a roadway is reconstructed. So those are some of the ways I would tackle this. Thank you, Judy. Becca? 
Yeah, so I largely agree with what my other co-candidates have said, um, but you know, the intersection of Holland and Cameron is personal to me. As my um, partner Eric was biking home a couple weeks ago, he was almost hit by a car there, pretty seriously. Um, so I would definitely agree with traffic calming measures there, including a raised table and throughout Cameron Street as well, just because it's a pretty wide boulevard and cars frequently fly down it. I live one block over on Elmwood Street, which is also frequently used as a cut through. Um, I definitely agree with making sure the Elwife Brook Parkway intersection at um, Powder House is that process is prioritized as quickly as possible and safety measures along Alewife Brook and Mystic Valley Parkways are um, brought forward you know we can work with our state delegation to advocate to mass DCR for those changes and that's something that I have experience with working with state legislators on the budget cycle um, I also think that we really need to pass a bike network plan and um, prioritize bus and pedestrian traffic across our Warren City thanks I will now go to our second question, keeping to the issue of transportation and a topic that has already been brought up, which is that of the designated bus lane from Clarendon Hill to Davis Square. Um, these bus lanes have been launched in other areas of the city uh, to great celebration, but also to great controversy to many of our residents. Um, so we would like you to spend the next minute to discuss that, but also to really discuss how you have worked with local residents to determine their direct level of support for such a change. Uh, we will start with Becca. Sure, so I have definitely heard some of that controversy while out canvassing. Um, I know that there's some controversy over the bike lanes and bus lanes at Winter Hill, um, especially the one going down Broadway uh, towards East Somerville. Um, and so I think, you know, making sure that we're doing traffic studies for the bus lane that goes from the Clarendon Towers to Davis Square to determine when it's most used and so that road can be best, um, best designated at different times of day even. So we could, you know, put in a bus lane only for when it's high traffic in the morning and afternoon. Um, uh, traffic periods but I've also been bringing this up with residents when I knock doors um, we've tried to engage residents throughout the campaign on you know making sure that our policy platform is truly representative of Somerville and especially of Ward 7 and we've you know tried to make sure that when we're asking folks like what are the issues that are important to you with the doors that we really listen and incorporate that so um, our policy platform has been updated like over the past several months to reflect that so those are a couple ways and we're always open to uh, new uh, feedback Thanks. Alex. Thank you. So in terms of ways that I've worked uh, in, in Ward 7 and Somerville at large on these issues specifically, so as a member of the Somerville Bike Committee, I work directly with the city collecting data, talking with residents, attending public meetings. And so if we think about Powder House Boulevard in Ward 7, um, in 2019, unfortunately, two people were struck in a marked crosswalk. One of them was fatally killed and the other was seriously injured. Um, and there were several meetings to accelerate plans that were already in the works that myself and members of the Somerville Bike Committee and other advocacy groups in the city have been working on to improve safety on Powder House. Many of those changes have been implemented, which were a step in the right direction. But one thing that I found really striking while attending the public meetings in 2019 at, at the West Somerville Neighborhood School was that the kind of conversation around these changes always started with, here's the solution. We missed a huge opportunity to come together as a community to focus on what we want. Everybody in the neighborhood wants our neighborhood to feel safe, wants our streets to feel safe, wants kids to feel safe. And when we start from a solution, it comes from a us versus them mentality. Instead of coming together, finding what we value, what we can work on to get to those values, and then start to implement them. And I'll bring my experience from my work to do that going forward. Thank you, Alex. Judy? Thanks, Carrie. Um, most recently, a couple of days ago, I was uh, driving down Broadway, and the bus was using the bus only lane and beat me. Um, all the way down to Powder House, and I was so proud of that actually because it really it meant that the bus lane was working. Um, and so I'm a big fan of looking at um, what are the challenges and infrastructure needs across the city. I'd like to pilot a fare free bus program um, that both gets folks back to work, gets cars off roads, and helps reduce emissions across the city. Um, I look to um, other communities and what they've done around bus, bus lanes as, as inspiration. So recently, um, Mystic going into Medford, is there's a bus only time of day in the morning helping people get to work. And that was really a, a collaboration amongst city um, folks, people who live in the neighborhood, business owners, um, other folks that, that um, surround that neighborhood. And I'd look to that kind of collaboration to make these decisions in Somerville. So I'd like to stop there for a minute and just follow up with Alex. We have two of the candidates who have said that they would support the designation of the bus lane, but doing so during specific time periods and really establishing studies to determine its viability. Can you follow up in terms of where you stand? Is it a designated bike lane or bus lane 
throughout that, that area permanently, or would you be in favor of having those bus lanes have designated time periods? Absolutely. So I'm in favor of starting what works in the community. And so I think what we know is that a, temp a temporal bus priority lane works. Right? We know that there are businesses up and down Holland, there are businesses um, going into Davis Square. And so having a, where, having a rush hour time peak direction priority bus lane is, a, is an approach that we know works in other communities and can certainly work in ours, absolutely in full support of it. I think long term for the city, I think we need to really think about our relationship with cars in our community, both in terms of cut through traffic and residential cars. So we're prioritizing healthy transportation while ensuring that folks who really need access to private transportation have it. Thank you. Now to my third question on the issue of housing and redevelopment in Ward 7. Uh, candidates, again, will have one minute to answer the question. The redevelopment of the Clarendon Hill housing development has been in process for many years, and significant progress has been made in particular over the last five, with final permitting now at completion. How will you continue to work to move this process forward in an inclusive way? And what issues do you see on the horizon now that the project enters this new phase of finally becoming a reality? We're going to start with Judy. Thanks, Carrie. I've been really inspired by the work of the Tenants Association to ensure that their needs are met and demands are met um, as the agreement was being developed. I'm really proud that Letitia Scott and Maggie Joseph, both members of the board of the Tenants Association, are supporting me and have endorsed me in this campaign because, correctly, they trust me to listen to the needs of the resident, make sure that we go to Clarendon Hill, have conversations, be at the meetings and be present, and hold the developer and management company accountable during the redevelopment process and once it's completed. Um, in particular, I want to look to the management company to up upkeep and maintenance on the property, make sure that families' needs are met. We know there's a lot of families there with kids that are in the West Somerville neighborhood school, so I'm, I'm heartened to hear that um, the relocation efforts are happening around families' needs in Clarendon Hill. Um, and additionally, they're going to be a part of the conversation as we look to the Rotary and for the um, changes that are going to happen around North Street development. So I want them at the table as partners in this effort. Thank you. Becca. Yeah, I think this is a great question because we really owe safe, clean housing to the residents of Clarendon Hill, right? We've been seeing delays due to the COVID pandemic, but it's really time to pick it up and push this project to its completion. So I will continue to engage residents. I've been canvassing throughout Clarendon Hill over the past couple of months, um, and I will push for the developer to move forward, either attending meetings, you know, trying to call them in, um, and be in close contact with the residents. Um, I know legislators through my work on the budget to raise this issue to if we get stalled at some point, and I think that we really need to ensure that the right to return that was um, signed into the agreement is followed through on, right? Like, there's going to be a pretty big displacement process as the project gets underway this fall, and I think we need to, you know, explore providing transportation to the West Somerville Neighborhood School to the families, right? We um, know that some of them might be relocated to the Mystics, and that's a pretty far trip to get all the way back to Ward 7, right? And I don't think it's equitable to assume that everyone has their own private transportation that they can rely on. Um, and I think on the horizon, we can just continue to push forward with the Tenants Union and push forward together. Thank you. Alex? Great. Thank you. I am, I'm, I'm in agreement with both everything that Judy and Becca said, and I think for me what's most important is that we center the people who are most affected by any change in the process, and that's just not in a nominal way to say, hey, we, in, we reached out to the Tenants Union, we reached out to so-and-so to get their perspective. I want folks to be actively engaged with the city, with the contractors throughout the entire process to make sure that their voice isn't just heard, but that it's also made, it's also taken upon in terms of actions, in terms of changes and improvement. I think we can only make meaningful change that will stick and be valuable if those who are most affected are, are actively involved throughout the entire process. And then for me, the, the top priority is to make sure that there's stability for families. When we are, when we are relocating temporarily people into, into new housing while the development is taking place, we need to make a top priority to make sure that kids' lives who have been wildly disrupted in the last two years are maintained as consistent as possible in terms of their schooling and other early childhood education, and to make sure that they can come back home when the development is done. Thank you. Now for our fourth question, specifically on the issue of COVID-19 response. Candidates, again, will have one minute to answer the question. Given everything we know about the science around COVID-19 to this point, why was Somerville one of the last school districts in the area to bring students in special education and English language learners back to school last year? What would you have done differently or encouraged the mayor, school committee, and SEU to do differently during the school reopening fight last year, if anything? We'll begin with Alex Anderson. Great. Thank you. 
So as a parent in this race, I experienced COVID from a parent's perspective in a way that I wasn't expecting. For the first six months of quarantine, we had no child care. And for the last four weeks, we've had no child care. And so I know what it's like to have two kids in my house who need constant attention while trying to work. And I think one of the challenges that we had is we had a very cautious um, administration in, 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 the, in, the city, in City Hall in terms of our reopening plan. And I think a lot of that was, was very important. Um, the, the quality of our schools varies greatly from the Brown School to the West, Num West Somerville Neighborhood School in terms of this, the stability, health, and safety of the building, especially from a vent ventilation perspective. What I think the city needed to do was to provide more services for families if they weren't going to allow folks back into home, especially in the regards of internet access to, to schooling and making sure that folks are actually having a reasonable and, and um, viable form of education while being virtual. I also think the city needed to have an opportunity needed to reinvest and double down on some of the outdoor efforts to provide access to families to be able to care for their children's education. Becca? Sure. So I just want to recognize that it's been a really tough year for families and I really feel for everyone that has gone through this. And I think that, you know, when the mayor closed the schools, you know, the city council didn't really have a check on the mayor's power. So I think that's something that should be introduced through the charter reform process that we're starting this year. Um, if I was elected on the city council during the reopening fight, I would have fought for you know us to invest heavily in infrastructure that would make it easier for us to reopen, um, invest in our infrastructure at schools that have you know very low airflow like the Brown School, um, and make it easier for folks in case that there's a next time, um, like God willing that there's not a next time, but like in case that there's you know greater um, illness. Uh, and that the schools are there for the long term. And I think that, you know, the minute the mayor opened the schools, the teachers were in schools teaching. So we really need to make sure that we are um, centering, centering um, the folks that really need to be, sorry, <laughs> the folks that really need to be um, centered and make sure that, you know, the vulnerable can make sure that we're still getting resources to them, including green space outdoors and having classroom space outdoors um, and making sure that young kids are safe and able to get vaccinated when they're eligible. Judy? Um, thanks so much. I think what was really challenging about um, this particular year, well, this year was challenging for a lot of reasons, but one of the biggest challenges was that this particular scenario pitted teachers against parents, against the administration, against elected officials, and the folks that lost were our students. I agree with Alex, there were ventilation challenges with our aging schools, um, and that's something the city council can do something about in the coming years. As we think about money coming in for infrastructure, we should invest heavily in making sure our schools are safe and their air quality is safe. And as we know, COVID might be with us for a really long time. Like Becca mentioned, there might have been creative ways for us to bring some of the students together who were in most need of services during this time. It was a long time for students not to be around one another, not to be with, with their peers, um, and their social emotional wellness really suffered. Um, so I think as a city councilor, I would have done more around communication with our parents and making sure if I were governor, I would have prioritized teachers for vaccinations so we can get them back to school much more quickly. A follow-up question will be our, our next question, the fifth question, and again, uh, candidates will have one minute to answer this question. Uh, on the issue of children and families in Somerville, many families cite limited or inaccessible out-of-time programming like after-school programs, camps or summer school, and limited youth recreation or sports opportunities, especially in comparison with the offerings of our neighboring cities, as a main driver for the relocation of families out of our city. Given the extremely high adult turnover every few years in the city of Somerville, what is a city councilor's responsibility? Or what will your goals in particular be to promote municipal programs that support children and families in our community? And here we are going to be starting with Judy. I'm glad you asked this. I've heard this a lot on the campaign trail actually. Um, parents talking about the need for more out of school time activities and in particular more information um, about what's out there. Um, you know, I, this is, this is an equity issue as well for our, our students that um, may not have access to um, summer camps that might be really expensive. And so making sure that um, our parents know what's out there, what's accessible, what's free of charge is really, really critical. I think we need a youth center in Somerville. Um, and the, the one that's right now used at the Mystic is sometimes inaccessible for some of the youth that are at Clarendon Hills or Clarendon Towers in particular. So even thinking about piloting a shuttle service um, to allow students to be able to, and youth to be able to connect together at the, the current center that we're used as a youth center or building one and really investing in that. 
Um, I'm also really excited to see the West Somerville Neighborhood Schoolyard being redesigned. And as city councilor, I would accelerate the construction to make sure that outdoor space is utilized um, with, the, with the students at the West Somerville Neighborhood School. Alex? Thank you. So as a parent who takes my kids to the park every day and who has tried to sign up for Somerville Recreation activities uh, every year for the last three years, uh, I know exactly what it's like to feel that the city is not providing enough resources for families to stay here. So I think in one, in one very important way, we need to invest and expand the types of programs that we already have, whether it's swimming lessons at the Kennedy School or programs like the, um, the, the teens who are in the parks right now on behalf of the city um, able to watch parents' children during the day so kid, parents can run errands or do some work um, while knowing that their kids are safe in the, in the hands of, of involved youth in our community who are working on behalf of the city. We need to expand these programs and communicate them. We also need to do better outreach to make sure that that communication is accessible in terms of different languages and in different mode and modes and mediums, not just through social media, but also through physical mail and having people in the community, um, for example, champions in the community. I also think we really need to think about our existing parks. The Clarendon Hill Apartments are right across the street from Dillboy Stadium, a beautiful ball ballpark, incredible grass and incredible playground, and you have to cross a highway to get there. Too many of our parks require crossing highways for our kids, and we need to focus on improving our streets so we can utilize children's services the best. Becca? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what other folks have already said, so I definitely agree with, you know, expanding our after-school programming and fighting for universal pre-K. Um, I also think that, you know, the schoolyard redesign has been brought up to me by multiple folks in the community surrounding West Emerald Neighborhood School, so I'll definitely fight for that in the budget. Um, I also definitely agree with building a youth center that is more centrally located for more of our kids and, you know, has a lot of programming accessible in different languages, in different culturally relevant ways. Um, and I think part of that is also providing transportation across the, the city for students to get to that location so that, you know, we're not, again, not relying on folks with private uh, vehicles to provide that. Um, I also definitely agree with, you know, making sure our streets are safer, uh, implementing the Somerville Alliance for Safe Streets recommendations, and fighting for better um, responsiveness from Mass DCR along the parkways. Um, and I think we really need to invest in a green and open space fund from developers so that we can build those where they're available, right? We're the densest city in New England, but we need more spaces for our kids to play. And of course, uh, investing in housing and affordability to end our displacement crises. Thank you. All right, now we will move to the next section where each candidate gets to ask questions of other candidates. Each candidate will have the opportunity to pose a 30 second question to their fellow candidates, after which they will have one minute to respond. As a reminder, I will allow those whose names are invoked to respond for 30 seconds or may ask a candidate to further explain a question. Uh, we are going to begin with Becca with the first question. Awesome. So this is for both of you. Um, I have talked to thousands of residents across our ward where people are feeling really worried about climate change and how our community is disappearing as people get priced out. The incremental approach that we've seen over the last several decades has not yielded the transformational change that we need. How are your policies around housing and climate change different from what we've seen in the past and capable of meeting the moment? How are you going to ensure that we meet our climate goals by 2030? Why don't we begin with Alex? Great, thank you so much. So for me, the intersection of affordability and climate infrastructure is super important. So if you think about Ward 7 specifically, we're a neighborhood that is overwhelmingly residential, where the main institutions are our parks, our schools, um, our publicly supported housing, and our, our bus transit station that involves three bus lines near the Clarendon Hill Towers. And so if we want to move forward in terms of real climate change, the levers that the city council itself can pull is to make sure that we're getting transportation and infrastructure right. Bicycles and walking are 10 times more impactful than electric vehicles or other modes for cities to actually have an impact on greenhouse gas emissions in their community. This is also a massive public health issue because of the conditions that cars create, not just in terms of immediate harm, but long-term public health harms in terms of cancer rates, asthma rates, learning disabilities. All of those tie to the volume of traffic that we have and its density. And so when I'm thinking about what we can do, we need to start with our streets because that's the lever that city council can pull. And also we know that the cheaper and easier it is for cars to easily pass through your community, the more expensive the properties are in your community. So fixing our roads focused on people also addresses affordability and our housing stock. Judy? Thanks for this question. I, I read the uh, report that came out earlier this week that said the world was on fire um, with, with much concern. Um, and so I agree, I think we need to take bold action and um, be ambitious with our climate goals. 
Um, 65% of our housing stock in Somerville was built before 1940. So thinking about ways to incentivize landlords to make retrofits helps reduce fossil fuel emissions, improves indoor air quality, and increases resilience to flooding and heat extremes, which we're seeing more of because of climate change. Um, I also think we can look to recent collaborative work with the Green Justice Coalition um, for inspiration of on what we can do here in Somerville. They did work to transform statewide weatherization programs that resulted in a reduction of fuel costs for working families, increased pay for workers, and reduced 84,000 pounds of greenhouse gas emissions in the state. So those are some of the things I want to focus on. I also, as I've mentioned, want to pilot a fair free bus program, which gets cars off streets, gets people back to work, and lowers carbon emissions. The next candidate question will come from Alex Anderson. Great. Thank you. So again, my question is for both Judy and for Becca. Um, so I, as a, as a person who if I were not running, I'd be very excited about both of your candidacies. Um, I think we've had a lot of alignment over all of our forums so far in terms of the issues. So my question to you is how do you think of the role of the Ward 7 counselor specifically in comparison to a counselor at large or a state rep or someone in the governor or in the, in the, in the mayor's office um, in terms of the needs and wants of Ward 7 residents specifically? Uh, let's begin with Becca. Awesome. Yeah. So I think that you know the Ward Seven Councilor represents a smaller area than like a state rep or an at-large councilor, and I think we have some significant um, issues that are you know unique to Ward Seven, especially our relationship with Tufts University, which I would advocate for a strong pilot agreement with uh, to the mayor's office. Um, the Clarendon Hill redevelopment, which we've already talked about, thanks to Carrie. Um, the uh, Parkways, Alewife, and Mystic that you know are pretty dangerous, and the um, role of you know the the encroaching city, the our neighboring cities on development and how we handle our housing as a as you've already said uh, strongly residential ward I think we have a lot to address in our housing stock and making sure that both renters and longtime residents feel welcome here um, and that's what I really see as the role of the ward seven counselors to really work with everyone for the community that works for all of us Judy I agree I think um, the Ward 7 City Councilor needs to be laser focused on the needs of the residents that's who will be held accountable for if elected um, a third of all public housing in Somerville is in Ward 7 so also meeting the unique needs of folks um, and holding develop the developer and management company accountable for the redevelopment at Clarendon Hill is a, is a really unique focus for the next Ward 7 City Councilor I also think, also think we can do more around advocacy to bring the Green Line extension over to West Somerville. Um, so Route 16, you know, uh, got left out of the deal. Um, and so I'm excited to see the rest of Somerville um, get their Green Line stops up and running by 20, or spring 2022. And I think we could do more to advocate for the Green Line extension to come to West Somerville. Um, so I think it's, a, it's really a partnership, making sure we're focused in on the needs of the residents, um, working with the rest of the city council, the mayor's office, our state representatives, our state legislature um, to, to meet the needs of the, of the entire ward. Thanks for the question. Thank you. The next question from a candidate comes from you, so go ahead. Shocking, I'm gonna ask both of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as you know, Somerville is getting $60 million in ARPA funds and has recently hired a director to oversee the spending. So how would you both propose we spend these dollars? Let's begin with Alex. So great, I think that in terms of addressing affordability and um, long-term climate sustainability, I think that needs to be our priority. I think we really need to make sure that we are taking these funds and putting them into our community in a way that can make sure that we're getting towards our goals of affordability and sustainability. So one of the things I've been talking about um, in terms of our in terms of our previous forums is that I think the city should establish a fund um, that is fed over time in terms of any types of federal grants or other monies that we can get and also in terms of rethinking some of our fee and revenue collection from a city's perspective that can allow the city to beat the bank when giving loans to people who want to develop in our community. And so, for example, the city would be able to provide preferential lending to folks who commit to 30% affordability long-term and permanent in any development that they do. I think if we are to get out of our affordability crisis in Somerville, we need to be building more units. And if we're going to build more units, we have to prioritize equity, class equity, race equity. And that's, that's for me, the vision for the future. And I think one of the mechanisms there is to create a, a centralized city-based funding to allow development to, to focus on affordability. Becca? Yeah, so I agree. I would focus on affordable housing and building 
um, affordable net zero public housing for the lowest uh, income folks in our city. So that is, you know, zero to 30 percent of area meaning income that covers, you know, service workers, um, elderly folks, disabled folks. And these are really folks that have been left out by the market development in Somerville. So I really think, you know, investing in sustainable futures with public housing, especially near transit stops where the city owns land, is a huge opportunity that we could use some of this ARPA money for, um, as well as piloting a fare free META, um, investing in the most impacted from the pandemic with mental health programming and increasing cultural events when it's safe to do so so that the city really coheres together again and creates an inclusive city. Thank you. I want to pause here for a time check to make sure we can go with the next round. We're good. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to have another round of questions from the candidates. So we'll begin again Rebecca with another question. I'm actually all set. I don't have another question. So. Okay. Alex? Great, thanks. Um, so maybe this is a, a visionary question, but um, where do you both see Somerville in 10 years? Let's start with Judy. Sure. Um, such a great question. Uh, fulfilling all of our summer vision goals for one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll use a little bit of the ARPA fund question too, because we're getting this influx of federal dollars. Um, and it's the first time really in a long time that we have such opportunity um, to think about what, what we envision our city to be. Um, and I think we need to spend those, those dollars both meeting urgent needs of folks right now coming out of the COVID crisis um, and also being aspirational for our city, investing in infrastructure like new schools that are aging and crumbling, um, looking at our water and sewer system, which a lot of folks are talking about because there's an increase in rates and that's because there's been, there's, it's an aging system that needs de deeply needs repairs. Um, and so thinking also about our climate goals, reinvesting in our um, arts infrastructure in the city and community festivals and community building as well. Um, so, you know, I see Somerville in 10 years as being as vibrant as ever, um, as connected as ever, and looking forward to being a part of that. Thank you. Becca? Yeah, so I think the Somerville in 10 years depends on where we want to take it, right? So I definitely agree with investing in housing and our climate goals, as folks have already stated, but I think it really depends on who we elect in this um, election and what goals that they have, right? I think that we really need to take an organizer's mindset here and build the future that we demand, right? We need to build new housing that can really serve the needs of folks that are lowest income in our city, as I've already said, um, strive to meet our climate goals by 2030 to avert the worst of global warming, and you know, make sure that our public infrastructure and public transportation works for more folks by piloting a fare free MBTA. Um, I would love to see a vibrant, beautiful Somerville in 10 years, but if we keep going with business as usual, then people will keep being priced out of Somerville. Um, the city will continue to be gentrified and our schools will continue to crumble. So we really need to push for bold, transformative change over the next 10 years to build that future that we deserve. Alex? Great. I, am I okay. allowed to answer my own question? No. Yeah, um, oh, excuse apologies. me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I need to go back. I'm, I'm recycling here. I apologize. Sure. Um, so the next question is going to, because we've skipped Becca, uh, the next question is going to come from Judy. Great. Um, so 23 of our small businesses have closed in the last year. So I'm curious, how would you propose to support small businesses as a city councilor, and which one is your favorite in Ward 7? All right, uh, let's start with Becca. Oh man, I don't want to get spicy. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's the spiciest I get. I know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I guess if I had to choose a small business, I would pick the one I most recently got takeout from, which is Guru the Caterer, um, in between Teal and, uh, you know, North Street. So that's my favorite small business. And I think that we really need to be flexible with, um, you know, small business permitting. We can explore loan forgiveness for that, as well as tax forgiveness. Um, continue to allow restaurants to do outdoor dining throughout the season if they really want to in the winter as well. Um, and see you know, what we can do for cultural events to support those folks throughout the summer and fall as a way to you know, generate business and activity around those businesses, um, including like you know, yard sale that is coming up this weekend that I'm personally really looking forward to as a way to get out in the community that's not canvassing. Um, and just be creative and recognize that a lot of these are owned by immigrants and are really the lifeblood of our community. Alex? Great. 
So I don't know that I could pick a favorite Ward 7 uh, small business, but I can tell you the one that I have the uh, most unique memory of, which was True Bistro. Um, at, when my wife was eight months pregnant with Riley and our friends had just recently got engaged and other friends had recently purchased their first home, we went to True Bistro for a celebratory dinner and were just blown away. And I am very excited that True Bistro was able to come back after taking a extended closing um, during COVID and have the outdoor dining. In terms of supporting businesses long term, I think this is really where focusing on the walkability and bikeability of our neighborhood comes into play. Cars don't spend money as businesses, people do. And so if we're going to actually influence the, the revenue generation for our community, we need more people walking into our business areas, walking into Seal Square, walking down Broadway, walking down Holland. We need people biking there and seeing it as a destination, not just a cut through environment. Having the street eateries, which I want to expand and heavily invest in, um, is a great, great addition to our community. Investing in things like our tree canopy to make it not so hot when you're standing on the sidewalk waiting for a coffee or waiting for takeout. Those are the types of things that we can do. Anything that we can make to feel our environment feel great for people will work for our local businesses. I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a follow-up question because Becca left us a, a little bit of time. Um, and that is to the issue of small business and folks who are kind of teetering on the edge as we work towards the COVID-19 recovery from that perspective economically. Um, as Judy mentioned, many of our businesses, a quarter of them, was suffering an absolutely devastating situation of, of loss and, and relocation or, or closure. Um, moving forward, there are, continues to be those businesses that are teetering on the edge of, of failure. What can we do over the next period of time, whether it's 18, 36 months, uh, to support those businesses, to shore them up so that we don't see further closures uh, in those situations. Let's start with Becca. Sure, yeah, I agree with what Alex said around walkability and making sure that those are well attended with small businesses. Um, I also think that, you know, the city's, I think it's called the Small Business Department. Um, I forget if that's the real title for it, but making sure that they're providing um, coaching and loan forgiveness and access you know, helping small businesses with access to state and federal resources is one way that we can help folks recover from the pandemic and build a more stable future. Um, I'd also, you know, look into seeing if we can work to develop a Teal Square master plan like other squares in our community have built so that we can really develop a vibrant square that's not being left behind. Um, and we're making sure that the Teal Square pit is being filled and is, you know, filled with a vibrant local business. Um, I think, you know, it's gonna be a challenge coming out of the pandemic and building over the next year or two and into the future. And I think we really need to make sure that we're listening to folks and taking their voices at the center of the table. Judy, let's jump to you. Great. Um, I am a small business owner myself, so this is an issue near and dear to my heart. Um, I've sat down and talked to many of our local businesses in Ward 7, as well as the head of the Economic Development Department in Somerville. Um, and there are three areas I want to focus on. One is immediate needs, which is p fee and permit forgiveness. Um, we were able to um, forgive much of the uh, costs associated with outdoor dining and other ways that restaurants are getting more revenue now during the pandemic, um, but that's not a long-term solution. And so making sure um, we continue to, to forgive those permits and fees for the next year or so as, as um, folks get back up and running. Um, also long-term small business relief, we are getting some federal dollars for that. And so making sure that especially our immigrant small business owners have access to this, including um, assistance uh, if they need some language capacity as well as something the city should do and will continue to do, um, as well as providing technical assistance. We heard a lot of small businesses say they had to pivot during COVID to learn how to um, utilize online platforms. And so they wanted more technical assistance. And I believe continuing that training is something we can do as a city. Alex. Thank you. So I agree with everything that Becca and Judy have said. A couple of other ideas that I think are very important is one, I think throughout winter, I think the city of Somerville seriously needs to explore shoveling sidewalks, especially on major streets like Holland and Broadway. Uh, other major cities do this. Montreal, in fact, shovels their sidewalks before they shovel their streets. Um, it helps small businesses. It helps people of all abilities walking, but especially people with walking needs um, getting through our sidewalks in the winter. So I think that's one way to support the entire community that also benefits businesses. I think another thing that we can do to really benefit small businesses is to review the practice that requires for permitting and licensing when businesses want to make improvements or upgrades to their environment. Um, it's, it's a very long process and it can be very confusing. And from my experience in working a lot of different complex systems, it is very likely that the systems that we are using are outdated or complex for reasons that um, could benefit from a, a significant review. So we should really be looking into ways that we can streamline all the processes for our small businesses because we don't want mom and pop shops closing and being replaced with banks. And finally, I really do think that the city should support through funds the beautification of streets and buildings in the forms of trees, murals, and other th types of things that make the environment more aesthetically pleasing. 
Thank you. That will conclude that portion of our debate. We are going to conclude today's debate in total by giving the candidates an opportunity to make a one-minute closing statement. Uh, we'll begin with Alex. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for listening in and for joining me today. Um, as I mentioned, I think Ward 7 is in a really great position. Um, we have, I think, a bounty of great candidates here today. Um, and I would be incredibly excited to be voting for Becky, for Becca or Judy, apologies, um, if I were not running. Uh, and I think that if you're a Ward 7 voter, there's a tough task ahead of you. I think the thing that separates me from, from Judy and Becca is that I'm the only parent running in this race and that I'm the only person who has done the meaningful work in terms of street and sidewalk advocacy and improvement. And I really do think that that's the intersection that matters for a Ward Ward 7 counselor. We are a community of residents, of parks, of schools, of publicly supported housing, and of, tra and of transit. And we are also the entryway into Somerville. We have historically prioritized the ease of cutting through our neighborhood at the expense of the people who live in our neighborhood. The impacts on our health, the impact on our climate, the impact on our affordability, and the impact of what it means to raise kids in this family is 100% tied up in what we do with our streets and what connects us. I believe I am the candidate that brings that experience to the table, and I really look forward to making Somerville work best for our families for the future that can be bright for everyone. Judy? First, I want to say thank you so much to Carrie for the moderation, for the Somerville Media Center, um, and to my fellow candidates for this debate today. It's always good to hear the differences um, and similarities uh, around the issues that we, we so dearly care about here in Ward 7. Um, Unlike my fellow candidates, I'm the only one in the race with actual experience working in city government. The last 17 months, I've been ahead of the Immigrant Services Unit under Somerville's COVID operations. I've seen firsthand what it takes to support city residents through crisis. I've been on the other end of the call when folks are calling 311, asking for help with rental assistance, with food access, with just financial relief. And I've been on the front lines and working side by side with colleagues to make sure we're supporting our most vulnerable residents. And I think even though we're all vaccinated, with the current case rising, folks still out of work, we're going to be digging out of this pandemic for years. And I believe I can bring the experience to the table as a small business owner um, and as a community organizer to help lead us through after the pandemic. Thank you. Yeah. Becca? Yeah, I also want to thank Somerville Media Center and Carrie for all the work that you did coming t together today and my fellow candidates for taking the time out of busy schedules. Um, I have been organizing for years, building consensus with state legislators across the ideological spectrum to pass policy and for, to set aside millions of dollars that otherwise would not have been set aside for food security. Um, I'm really ready to take this experience passing policy into the role of city councilor, especially as city councilors pass policy themselves and our legislators. Um, I am really excited to talk to voters over the past many months, um, and I'm running on a really strong policy platform that centers the historically um, most impacted and tries to really craft a strong way out of this pandemic. So I really hope I can earn your vote in September and November, and thank you so much for your time. Well, I want to thank all of you for participating in this incredibly important conversation. This has been a production of the Somerville Media Center. The last day to register to vote or change your address for the preliminary election is Wednesday, August 25th. The preliminary election will be held in Somerville on September 14th. And the final election of the last two standing candidates will be on Tuesday, November 2nd. My name is Carrie Rodriguez. Thank you so much for joining us today and please remember to vote.